Hi everyone, uh, Phil Travis here, and uh, this week's lesson is on the 1920s, the, we the Weimar Republic, and the rise of Nazism. And we're going to be looking at a number of, uh, of, of, of items of artwork and architecture, uh, respective of this time period. The Weimar Republic was, in a lot of respects, um, discredited from the beginning. Um, the Weimar Republic, and that's why this section is titled Discrediting Democracy. Uh, the Republic had been something that many individuals had sought in Germany for a long, long time, and it was an attempt at creating a democratic democracy with uh, you know, civil liberties that, that we know and understand, but it was really discredited almost from the beginning. Um, it was seen, even the people who staffed the Weimar government um, oftentimes made up anti-Republican factions who had very little interest in the government. So Weimar was often associated in some cases with treason uh, or the crime of November, um, as was often uh, the manner in which the Treaty of Versailles was referred to. So Weimar was the government, it's uh, named for where the government was created at, at the end of World War I. Um, and it was the government that ultimately signed the Treaty of Versailles. And the Treaty of Versailles was very hard on Germany and caused a lot of, of anti-government uh, um, factions, whether on the left or the right, to mobilize against the government from the very get-go. Uh, this map depicts for you areas like the Rhineland, which would be made a demilitarized zone, um, near the border of the Low Countries in France. It shows territories lost by Germany, and uh, the loss of these territories were but one of the perceived negative consequences of the Versailles Treaty. The Versailles Treaty, and it's important to note that the Versailles Treaty was a shock to the German people, to all German people. It was not as though there was somehow continual news reporting and that all the German people kind of were aware of what was happening. Uh, instead, uh, the Germans had, in a lot of respects, made Woodrow Wilson their voice at the treaty, at the treaty conference in Versailles. And, you know, Wilson stood for the rhetoric and the ideals of peace without victory. Wilson stood for the notions of a fair peace, one that would not create animosities and create a ruinous future outcome that might lead to another war. And, and, and so German, the, the German government really put its chips behind Wilson. And in fact, the Germans who were, will, will be forced to sign the Treaty of Versailles, um, the German government, though, did not have a voice at these talks. The German government was basically handed a treaty and was basically told, you either sign this treaty or allied forces are going to occupy Germany. And so it becomes known as the dictated peace uh, in Germany, and it was a shock to all Germans. Um, the Treaty of Versailles, and this is a, a look at how, um, how the German people would have uh, received this, uh, this treaty. Um, it was a treaty in which there would be huge territories cut out of the German Empire, the German Empire, both continentally and overseas, was, was uh, um, taken apart. Germany was given something called the War Guilt Clause, Article 231 of the treaty. And the War Guilt Clause forced Germany from accepting that it was solely responsible for the war. And that as a result of it being solely responsible for the war, it was forced to accept massive... Um, reconstructions of its military, huge reparation payments, and of course this was this was the essence of what Wilson did not want, and it just goes to show just how little Wilson as one figure at Versailles could do uh, against the, uh, the stronger position of individuals like um, the French Prime Minister or the French President or the British Prime Minister, for example. And so the treaty that is ultimately produced is one in which Woodrow Wilson had to sacrifice many of his ideals. And he did this because he wanted to keep some, some basic structure from his 14 points together. 
um, and that was the, the League of Nations. But the treaty is, is very harsh. Um, the reparation payments on Germany uh, amounted to the equivalent of, you know, almost $400 billion in 2008 money. It was absolutely massive um, reparation payments. The German, uh, the German military was basically completely disarmed. The, they could have no, uh, effectively no military capable of any meaning, meaningful offensive force or of any kind or even defensive. Only 100,000 men in their army. They were, this is of course at the kind of early age of air forces, they were not allowed to have an air force. And the irony of that, by the way, is that while these reparations were placed on Germany, by the early 1930s, the restrictions on the Air Force and also on long-range artillery, which the Germans were also prevented from having, uh, but this all encouraged Germany to be very um, eager in the development of rocket technology because it was kind of like a loophole in the early 1930s. And, of course, that's one of the reasons why the Germans were ahead of the other countries when it came to developing um, effective rocket technology and of course during World War II you see this of course with the V1 um, and then of course particularly the, v, the V2 rocket which is the first kind of ballistic missile. Germany lost huge amounts of territory 15% uh, of its total pre-war territory it lost Alsace and Lorraine and of course German territories in Poland loss of all of its overseas colonies and of course, also areas like the Rhineland, uh, which were German areas, were demilitarized and made um, like effectively like the way that if you were to, to, to use a comparison, if you remember from the 1990s before, after the Persian Gulf War and before the war in Iraq started, uh, if you remember that period at all, um, Iraq was kind of separated with these two no-fly zones in the north and the south. And that's sort of like what happened with the Rhineland. I mean, they were areas that the German military could not go in and could not operate in. They were areas that were basically demilitarized um, in the interest of providing for a, um, um, for a defense for the French uh, in the Low Countries as they were concerned about um, the actions that you know, we saw at the beginning of World War I with invasions through those areas. But this is uh, ultimately known as the dictated peace for German people, um, and it is incredibly controversial, and it's very it's very damaging to the Weimar Republic right from the outset, because it is this peace that really labels the Weimar Republic in the eyes of many groups as treasonous, as um, individuals who perpetrate the crime of November, um, of a government that no German person could could feel they could have full faith in. And so the Weimar Republic was a, a republic sort of in, in, in act and in, in, in image, but in reality and action, very few people were turning to the Weimar Republic as the solution for the German nation. You can see here, and you remember this image from the first image, you see on the, on the left the image from the beginning of, of World War I, and now on the right, you see the image of, of Germania, uh, martyrdom, Germany's martyrdom. Uh, so Germany coming out of, of World War I and Versailles is very much um, looking inward with a sense and a feeling that it has been um, fundamentally uh, treated unfairly and is suffering at the hands of capitalist foreign powers. You see here an image of a wounded uh, or a, a German soldier who during World War I of course uh, lost his leg. Um, the German population with all of the changes in territory, the German population is, is down. Uh, in Germany suffered tremendously uh, from World War I. Um, of the 11 million mobilized for the war, almost 2 million die. Um, over 4 million are wounded. And that accounted for over 50% of those mobilized for war, which if any of you guys understand figures for, you know, operational capabilities of military units, that's an incredibly high rate, a, a casualty rate. 
And so World War II was always uh, already a very, very heavy burden. And Versailles uh, really, really made it that much worse on the psychology of the German nation um, and also to how they will look at Weimar because the Weimar Republic, the Weimar government is the one that most people turn to uh, when it comes to um, who is considered at fault in, from the German perspective. Uh, the Republican government, um, also other rightist groups, of course, make it, you know, communists and Jews and, and these types of things as well. The consequences of this are increasing search for scapegoats and particular groups creating nationalist myths. And of course, the Nazis will be at the foreground of that by the late 20s and the early 30s. The myth of the undefeated army, and of course this is something that um, you know Hitler believed in. Hitler was, uh, of course, he served in the military during World War One, and uh, Hitler, you know, was absolutely devastated when when Germany surrendered, and he viewed that that the army had never been defeated, and that this was of the treasonous activity of communists and Jews and leftists who made up the Republican government. Stab in the back of Versailles, also sometimes referred to as the November criminals, which was another way of referring to, uh, for many of the rightist groups, uh, a way of referring to um, uh, the, the Weimar Republic's role in uh, the Treaty of Versailles, which ironically, you know, it had no role in it. Uh, the Weimar Republic didn't have a negotiating voice in the treaty, in the treaty talks, and they were basically given a treaty that every single person who would have signed that was like, would have looked at this and believed this is an incredibly harsh treaty. But it was either that or have, you know, Germany occupied. Um, and so, nonetheless, the Weimar Republic is the government that is associated with this. And it's also important to remember that, you know, when that treaty is being uh, discussed, Germany was experiencing, it does continue to experience until 1923, a series of violent uprisings in, in cities throughout Germany. And so the country was, in some cases, almost on the border, uh, on the verge of, of fragmenting. Germany is politically polarized as well. And this is another thing that really damaged the Weimar Republic. Um, Germany's politi the way that political parties had developed in Germany uh, because of the nature of government for so long was not as conducive to a sort of immediate move into a Republican government. Um, German political parties tended to be um, little more than, than localized special interest groups and there were, uh, there were really no truly effective national parties um, and for this reason you have in some cases you had as many as 25 parties um, that um, that were running in elections to the Reichstag um, you had I mean the the, the DAP uh, the German Workers Party which ultimately is the, the group that accepts Hitler and which Hitler ultimately uses to create the Nazi Party when Hitler joined that group in September of 1919 it was a group of like 40 people you know, and, and Hitler later referred to this. He said that was more of a club than it was a political party. And it's things like that that really attest to the extreme kind of political polarization of, of German politics. And that made it difficult to create a political consensus in Germany at this time. Going hand in hand with this as well, the kind of lack of a consensus behind the Weimar Republic, the sort of inability of Weimar to create uh, consensus as uh, as the nationalist symbol of government from almost anybody, um, at least on a large scale, played into um, rightist groups like ultimately the Nazis, um, who use anti-Semitism, who use the crimes of November and these types of things, and, and, and create propaganda and myth. Um, it allows them to increase their their ranks tremendously for those who don't seek a republic but rather seek a more strong arm dictatorship or military state. Um, that, that aspect of society increases significantly as a result of some of the problems with uh, 
uh, Versailles with the Weimar government, as well as in the political process in general in Germany. Also, revol revolutionary left groups, um, socialist, communist movements also go up significantly. And, of course, the, the Nazis were a nationalist socialist movement, and that's very different than a Marxist or a revolutionary socialist movement or a communist movement. Um, Hitler saw Marxist socialist, revolutionary socialist, and the communists as his enemy, um, even though he sought to create an intense sort of um, ethnic nationalist German state. And so the Nazis had a sort of socialist component as well as an extreme rightist component as well. But we shouldn't confuse the Nazis as the National Socialist Movement. You shouldn't confuse that with the same thing as like revolutionary socialism or, or certainly not communism. So the kind of pr political fragmentation in the Weimar Republic really encourages kind of radical groups on the fringes to gain significant um, amount of support while pretty much everybody remains more or less apathetic to the Weimar state itself. And in fact, even, even intellectuals like um, more left-leaning intellectuals in Weimar Germany, the ones that of all people you would expect would kind of be bolstering the strength of the, the state, even those individuals uh, were so critical that they almost naturally, um, whether they sought to or not, they almost naturally prevented the development of, of, of real political consensus with the Weimar government as well. So in a lot of respects, it's almost like a perfect storm working against Weimar. Another big factor in discrediting the Weimar Republican experiment was uh, an economic crisis that really hits Germany um, in, in the 1920s, but it's most acute in 1923. Um, Germany's economy collapses very early on, and of course we have to remember Germany comes out of World War I, and there are, there are revolutions and uprisings throughout the country. The, the, the state is, is given massive repar reparation payments that are, that will bankrupt the state. It, it forces the state to 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 uh, deficit spend on such a scale that it absolutely bankrupts the economy, and that causes one of the worst. Actually, it probably is the worst economic crisis for one country in, in all of the 20th century. And it was exacerbated by an action of pretty, particularly the French and the Belgian army uh, to occupy uh, the Ruhr Valley. Uh, the Ruhr is an area in Germany. It is the uh, industrial heartland, if you will, of Germany. It was kind of the economic centerpiece of, uh, of Germany. And uh, the French, the Allies, had massive reparation payments that were due them. And the, German, the Germans couldn't pay. And because the Germans couldn't pay, the French and the Belgians occupied the Ruhr Valley and basically simply seized it and seized the resources of it as a sort of form of, of payment. And that this action creates further political crises in the country and also further enhances the economic crisis in Germany. Um, in 1923, it really looked like like the, the Weimar Republic uh, might literally tear itself apart in a political, literal, well, I guess not literally, <laughs> the map is not going to tear itself apart, but that the Weimar Republic might, might break up into revolution and the government might fail. These are images from the French occupation of the Ruhr in 1923. Um, to the top left is a right-wing propaganda photo about French occupation. And below you see French troops crossing the Rhine River. Uh, to seize the reparations that are due of them uh, from the Versailles Treaty. The economic crisis is massively damaging to Germany. Um, huge runaway inflation in the country. Uh, by November of 1923, uh, $1 was, wor was worth 4.2 trillion marks, the, for the German currency. And you see here a $10 million banknote from 1923. You see here an individual burning banknotes for fuel because it was a cheaper form of fuel. 
So uh, an absolutely unthinkable economic crisis grips Germany. The consequence of this hyperinflation in Germany were the destruction of people's personal savings, um, economic and social ruin across the country. Um, the perspective of many was the collapse of morality, that somehow this is a perspective I'm talking about here, that, that somehow cheaters win and good people lose. And increasingly it plays into a feeling that will really be played up by rightist movements like the Nazis, um, that there was, that the, that the country and the world was somehow culturally bankrupt in the 1920s. That there was this kind of cultural decadence faced with the kind of, you know, good, fair play being, uh, being punished. Democracy was really, by many groups, like, of course, the rising groups like the Nazis, the, these types of groups, democracy is held responsible for this. And in a lot of ways, the culture of the 1920s, the Weimar Republic of the 1920s, uh, democracy, these types of things were held, as well as, of course, communists and, and Jewish individuals were held responsible for uh, this crisis. For a brief moment, though, actually, the Weimar Republic um, had a, a brief period in which it kind of came back to life. Um, Gustav Stresemann uh, restored order in 1923 and becomes associated with really creating the kinds of reforms that were able to um, allow the Weimar Republic to kind of gain some semblance of stability. Um, he brought an end to the Ruhr crisis. He... Um, he, he um, organized a treaty with the United States um, that really fundamentally helped Germany as the United States under the Dawes Act began sending payments to Germany to help Germany pay off the reparations and to kind of moderate this massive economic crisis. He creates greater international involvement in Germany um, that allows Germany to return to some level of stability. And so... Um, this leadership uh, was able to stave off the extreme um, situation uh, during the Ruhr crisis and create some semblance of, st of stability for the Weimar Republic. And as we'll get, we'll get to in a little bit, this was also the time in which the Nazi Party, in a failed attempt to overthrow the government, um, the Nazi Party will um, undergo a seeming final defeat that Hitler ultimately turns into... Um, a kind of myth and in, in, in a propaganda opportunity for um, the Nazi leadership. Another factor in a increasing perception the discrediting of democracy in Weimar Germany was, um, you know, a cultural revolution that's happening throughout the Western world. Um, many traditionals, traditionalists interpreted uh, the so-called new woman of the 1920s as evidence of cultural degeneration. And many individuals uh, moved towards opposition to Weimar because of their feeling that um, it was somehow democracy's fault, the, Republicans, the republic's fault, and um, that this cultural degeneracy of the 1920s was somehow um, symbolic of, uh, of, of, a, of a cultural decline in the country. And of course, Throughout the Western world, the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, was, uh, you know, known as a time of, uh, of, of, of cultural revolution in some respects, where people challenged norms of human relationships, they challenged norms of, of sexuality, um, they challenged the boundaries of, of previous times, and um, many in Germany saw this as cultural degeneracy. And of course, here you see a publicity photo from the musical Cabaret. And uh, this was based on um, Christopher Isherwood's book, Berlin Stories. And uh, it, this provides a depiction of the atmosphere of late Weimar culture uh, during the late 20s, early 30s. It's set in 1931, actually. This is a look at some of the modern art and architecture that develops during the Weimar period. 
again, the images from the Jazz Age, the flappers, uh, the new woman, these were things that certain groups um, saw as a degeneration of their culture, and they were motivated to create a kind of nationalism that would um, that would that would sort of rid Germany of these uh, of this cultural de degeneration, if you will. And here's another another example. Um, this is an iconic image uh, from Weimar, Weimar cinema. Um, conveying this story of, of cultural upheaval. Um, this is Marlene Dietrich, um, and this is from 1930, and it's an example of, you know, this sense of, in the Weimar Republic, that many held that there was this sort of degeneration of, of, of culture. There's many as well who interpret the um, the Weimar Republic as a symbol of defeatism, a, as a symbol of the, the ill forces of, of, of socialism or other radical left ideas. Many conservatives, uh, many conservatives look back to 1871. Uh, they, sought, um, they sought a return to, um, to monarchy, to strong, to strong leadership. And, and yet, an, yet another example of the kind of lack of political cohesive behind, cohesiveness or consensus behind the Weimar Republic. And, uh, you know, the Weimar Republic, too, was largely often manned by many of the people who were, um, who were, who were rightist, who were not, who were anti-Republican, at least. Um, and so another example of this. The Weimar Republic was kind of born in defeat and in revolution. There was continual discord and divisions. Uh, Versailles undermined the strength of the state. Uh, Hyperinflation, um, economic and social crises, uh, cultural change that many in society had a great deal of difficulty dealing with. The view that Weimar Republic and modern culture was somehow degenerate and immoral. And of course, this plays into the hands of the, the rise of fascists who feed on fear, they feed on anger, and on mythical visions of national restoration. I want to take a, a moment to talk a little bit about the early period of the Nazi movement, the Munich area era, the Munich era. Um, Munich is in Bavaria, and Munich became the center of the organization of the early Nazi movement. The original basis of the Nazi movement was a group known as the DAP or the German Workers Party and this ultimately becomes the, N the NSDAP or National Socialist German Workers Party. Um, it was a very small group, a group of about 40 people that um, in terms of its uh, understanding of society um, and of history tended towards anti-Semitism. Um, it was um, an opponent of democracy, an opponent of, of Republican government, and very much based on the idea that the Republic represented sort of uh, all the ills of, of society, of, of, of Judaism, of communism, and so forth. Adolf Hitler joined the, in the DAP uh, on September 12th, 1919, in a moment, or at least this was the beginning, this was the first day in which he he, he met with members of this group, um, and this was a moment in which he described this as the most important moment of his life. Um, Hitler, of course, was at the time not a German citizen. He was from Austria. He had spent time in Vienna. Um, he came from, from, from humble uh, roots, as did many of the people who made up this movement. 
Uh, many of the leaders of this movement were poorly educated um, and had, had, had not found success in other avenues of their lives. And this became a avenue for them to pursue their own fulfillment. Um, Hitler, of course, had been uh, you know, a failure in numerous areas of his educational life. And he, he grew up a, a, as, a, as, a, as an eccentric, sort of odd individual who had a very heightened view of himself. He was a dreamer, and he always um, saw himself sort of, sort of as the ultimate leader. And so he had this idea that he was a leader, while he really, uh, in, his, in, his, in his upbringing, was really, um, he had very few friends and, um, and, and had a tendency to think of himself as superior to others. Um, Hitler, of course, learned very much the art of speaking and of political uh, mobilization. It's really not until after World War I, as Hitler, who had served in the, in the army during World War I, um, Hitler um, was dismayed by Versailles by the end of the, um, by the, end of, the um, of the war. And this led him to uh, become more politically active. Before this, even though he, he bought into some of the ideas of theorists who theorized concepts of racial hierarchies and so forth, he was more focused uh, before this point on uh, becoming an artist. The movement really appealed to workers. It appealed to a fundamental anti-capitalist. Um, it was anti-elitist. And it promoted a sort of national social leveling. He was also involved in a radical critique of the republic as a treasonous, um, as a treasonous and incompetent movement. Democracy for these for this group was equated with mediocrity and corruption, whereas dictatorship was associated with national renewal, renewal leadership, and action. This is meant to depict um, Hitler as the rising figurehead of the NSDAP. The Hitler movement was, obviously it was a dictor dic dictatorial movement um, that created a cult around basically a messianic leader, um, a leader who would come and mythically deliver the German people from their sorrow into national greatness. And of course, that is where um, Hitler ultimately positions himself. Some of his primary, uh, some of the most primary individuals who were close to him, of course, Rudolf Hess, uh, Rudolf Hess, who was infatuated with Hitler, um, Hess even joined Hitler to jail when Hitler was sentenced to prison after the Beer Hall Putsch. Um, Hess was around when Hitler dictated the beginning of Mein Kampf. But also Ernest Rom, who was the head of the SA. Uh, the SA, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, was a paramilitary organization uh, for the Nazis in the 1920s. Dietrich Eichhardt, Alfred Rosenberg, Ermin Goring. These were some of the most influential early figures of the Nazi movement. They, these individuals were part of the apparatus in terms of organizing the SA, organizing po propaganda, and politically mobilizing individuals. The poster here reads, and remember, the Nazis were masters of propaganda. Um, and Hitler learned a lot from socialist propaganda. Even though Hitler himself does not believe in revolutionary socialism, he learned a lot from, from, from socialist propaganda uh, in the creation of his national socialist movement, which was different from revolutionary socialism. Um, but he learned a lot from that in the sense that he learned how you can use it to promote your message to wide arrays of people and to stir up their emotions towards things. 
The early Nazi movement was a regional movement. It was very small in the in the early 1920s, and it was centered in um, in, in Bavaria with the headquarters in Munich. It was focused around militarism. Of course, it's a fascist movement, so it's focused around extreme nationalism coupled with a chauvinistic uh, nationalism and militarism. Uh, it was organized around ritualized political violence. And depicted here in this image is an example of a brown shirt. And the brown shirts were the, the so-called SA, or the stormtroopers. Um, the st these individuals, which by 1923 made up about 15,000 people, uh, these individuals were effectively the, the paramilitary armed forces of the Nazis. And they were theoretically designed to pr protect the Nazis from communists at their meetings, but the reality was that they were really designed as an offensive group that would ultimately, in the eyes of the, of the figures who were leading the Nazi movement, would ultimately be the ones to create the revolutionary offensive that would overthrow the Weimar Republic and create a Nazi state and would place Hitler in a position of, of dictatorship. The early Nazi movement also was fundamentally based on concepts of racial hierarchy, particularly of works uh, that pertain to the so-called Aryan race that argued that so-called uh, Nordic Germanic peoples were a somehow higher evolved people. And uh, therefore, the essay also were, uh, were, were you know, part of taking a sort of, a, a sort of racial struggle to the streets. The social profile of Nazism in the fall 1923, um, by 1921 to 1923, the uh, membership had gone up very significantly. And of course, this is localized in Bavaria. Um, it's a relatively young movement, uh, mean average age, 27 years. 50% um, is 23 years or younger. Um, most members are male, 90 to 95% male membership. And females were, if, if there were female Nazis, not a lot of them, but females, the, the Nazis almost ignored females entirely at the early period uh, of this movement. And, um, you know, they really, um, they really provided no encouragement, avenue, or um, a, attempt to truly mobilize women. Um, and so it was a largely male membership. Um, the class composition of the Nazi party by 1923 was 36% workers, 52% middle class or lower middle class, and about 12% upper class. Nazism had a sort of birth and resurrection in 1923, and this was the so-called Beer Hall Putsch, or coup, the Beer Hall coup, if you will. Um, which occurred November 8th through 9th, 1923, during the Ruhr crisis. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, the context of this was hyperinflation. There were communist uprisings throughout the country. There was utter economic crisis. And of course, the French and Belgian forces had occupied the Ruhr. And so this was designed to be uh, the rise of a revolution in which the the SA and the armed forces in Bavaria would rise up and join Hitler and would go from B Bavaria to Berlin and would, uh, would create um, a new, would overthrow the Weimar government and would create a new German state. And actually, even, um, even the, the famous general from World War I, Ludendorff, was, uh, was, a, was a party to this conspiracy. The, uh, the push ultimately fails. Um, Hitler got Ludendorff to go along with him to an extent. Um, and Hitler at a beer hall tries to stage the beginning of the revolution by firing his pistol in the air and declaring that, um, that the revolution had begun. Um, there's a, ultimately a shootout uh, 
and um, 14 Nazis are killed, Goring is wounded, Hitler twists his shoulder, he runs away, and he's arrested, and, and, it, and it, it fails. But that failure did not necessarily um, wind up being a long-term and destructive failure for the Nazi party. Ultimately, Hitler will use this as publicity, and he'll use it to actually continue to create uh, the myth of Nazism and a myth of of, of, of martyrdom. Hitler was sentenced to, as I said, five years in, in, in Landsberg prison in Bavaria. And his time in Landsberg prison was, um, was, was hardly hard time. Um, Hitler was given a trial in which he was really able to capitalize on publicity to promote himself. And this is why it, it, it could have been the destruction of the Nazi movement, but it ultimately becomes the creation of the myth of the Nazi movement because rather than Hitler be completely discredited because Hitler had, he had run away and he was tried for treason, and rather than Hitler be discredited, he comes out in his trial and, and, and you know, discusses the, the, cr the criminals of November and the, you know, the, you know, the terrible conspiracies of Republican government and so forth, and he's able to create sort of a... Um, a more mythic idea of the, who this person was supposed to represent. In prison, he's allowed to have numerous vis visitors. He dresses in civilian clothes. He is um, he's um, 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 in nice, spacious areas. Um, his friend Rudolf Hess, who was almost obsessed with Hitler, joins him. And it's here, of course, where Hitler dictates the beginning of what becomes known as Mein Kampf. Uh, which is Hitler's kind of, um, um, it, it's Hitler's personal story about his struggle and about what he intends for Germany. Um, it, mein Kampf means my struggle, and it's, uh, it's a really terribly written work, but it becomes like uh, Hitler's manifesto, effectively. Hitler is released from prison after a year, um, and he returns to um, his work in, in Germany. The lessons uh, of the beer, beer Hall Putsch for the Nazis were the movement of Hitler into a role as the ind indispensable figure and center of the party. It also marked a movement away from revolutionary activity um, to uh, seeking political paths to power. So the Nazis um, increasingly sought to gain their, uh, their leadership through the political apparatus as opposed to um, through trying to stage coups and revolutions. It also was centered around the founding of of, of, of a myth uh, about the Nazi movement. Hitler is here pictured carrying what's, what, what becomes known as the blood flag. And this is part of the construction of the Nazi myth. This was a flag, it's a swastika flag, and it's got a single swastika in the middle of it, and it was present during the Beer Hall Putsch. And um, ultimately, of course, it, it was soaked in blood, and uh, the Nazi movement uses this as a way to... Um, to make the individuals associated with the Push martyrs and as symbols for a sort of um, a, 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 a triumphant movement that seeks to unify the country just despite the oppression from, from others. So uh, the Nazis increasingly moved to this type of symbolism to help promote their political power. <laughs> 